If you want to fast and pray, fast and pray for those days, especially on Saturday. If you have anybody that you really need to have come and listen, bring them on Saturday at 2 o'clock. The reason being, uh, he is going to discuss his heavenly trip when he went to heaven. I haven't heard completely all of it, but I've heard Pat and Cheryl, and I mean, they were so excited about what he was saying. He's got such tremendous knowledge. He brought up some, they brought up some things that he said that I've never heard before. I've heard a lot of things about people going to heaven and seeing things and understanding each person. When you hear it, each person sees it just a little bit different because everybody is kind of different. So I just want you to understand that if you were to take and bring somebody on the 2nd, or at, at 2 o'clock on the Saturday, March 5th. May 5th. May 5th. I'll get that right. We're always too late for March. That's next year. May 5th. What happens is, that's in my, my notes. I'm just putting this out, what the Lord is showing me. to. You might be surprised of the change of the people that you bring. Because I have told him, I says, open it up. I says, two until we're through. You don't know if we try to hinder the Lord by putting a time limit on what's going to happen. There's no time limit on God. I heard him, I think it was him that was, had mentioned or somebody mentioned about him. And others that I've heard, when you get into heaven, there's no time. There, you kind of know, but you know, have no time. It's just like the one guy that I talked about lives here in Des Moines. And he had said, he came here at one time, and he was saying that he w he got stuck in hell for two years. And I says, he was in hell for two years? He knew the time worldwide, but it, there was really no time. And I says, why? Because he, he was following ley lines. Ley lines is where they follow, there are lines that go from one place to another place, and when the astral project, they go down that line. Well, he got in the wrong line, him and a friend, and they went down into hell for two years, and they said they had a hard time getting back out. Luckily, they made it back. I'm thinking, wow, this is just blowing my mind away because I never heard such a thing like that. You know, most people won't hear things on those orders. But God shows me a lot of things that I've never heard, and I start praying and asking the Lord. But there are ley lines. There are ways that people have... They lay people and they lay these lines out for people to, to astral project across. I mean, it, it's quite amazing what's out there that we don't understand, but God knows and he'll show you if you need it. So the thing is, when we get in this, that's why you can sit in a place that's anointed. I'm asking for the power of God to be so anointed in this place that he might go seven hours and you're sitting there saying, oh, what well, was five minutes, wasn't it? We had that happen one time, well, many times, but this one time in particular, it just hit my mind, so it must be the Lord. We were at a church in Oskaloosa. The pastor was playing guitar, and he was singing. And we were all singing. There were seven of us there. And all of a sudden, I mean, we're in this little room because it was winter, and we didn't have a whole lot of people at that church either. And it, it was a lot of money to heat the whole church. So they went down to the room beside the furnace room. The furnace room was warm. There was a room right beside it. It was really easy to heat up. So we went down there on a Wednesday. And he was playing along. And all of a sudden, I heard a voice sitting beside me singing. A person singing beside me. And I, I looked over there. There's nobody there. And I says, what is this? And all of a sudden, I realized... It was an angel. So I stopped and I started to listen and I come to find out there's three or four more voices in there singing in this room because I knew everybody, seven people, you know everybody here. You know, like you're sitting here and you knew everybody's here and if you knew their voice and all of a sudden you start hearing somebody else singing right beside you, what would you do? Freak out. Oh, no, 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 no. You wouldn't do that. <laughs> you would realize something's going on. So... I took and I started listening more and more, and all of a sudden there was an amplification of a thousand voices. I'm not the only one that heard it. Debbie heard it. And it was a powerful anointed. I mean, we were just engrossed within the spirit. 
And then all of a sudden it was over. And we said, that wasn't very long. That was like five minutes. But when you looked at your watch, it was 45 minutes. Because when you get in the spirit, there is no time. He spoke at ch that church over here in, in the east side of Des Moines for four hours, they said. And they felt like it was a half an hour. He said there was one church and one church only that he's been in, from my understanding, that he went and he started at night and it didn't get through till 7 o'clock in the morning. And when I talked to him, he, and he says, well, what am I supposed to do? I says, say what God wants you to say. Well, what kind of time? So I told him the time, and on, on Saturday I says, two until we're through. And he says, huh? Two until we're through. I says, yeah. I says, I expect the Holy Ghost to show up. I says, when God's through, we're through. And we talked a little bit more. He says, well, what am I not supposed to talk about? I says, anything that God tells you to talk about, you talk about. He says, huh? <laughs> what about tongues? Yeah, we speak in tongues. <laughs> it's going to be recorded, yeah. So anyway, when we got through, he says, wow. He says, you know, when that happens, God moves. He says, there's very few places I can go that opens up the avenue for me to do what the Lord wants to have done. Now, we're going to tell people that if you have to leave at four, quietly pick yourself up and go out the door at four. That's fine. You don't have to stay here till whenever. But I'm just telling you ahead of time, expect whatever God's going to do. He might get through in two hours and we'll be out. And it's two hours. That's done. It's over. I kind of doubt it, but that could be. And when you walk in on that Saturday, I'm going to tell you one thing. You start calling on his anointing. You walk in here so hungry and so expecting, I guarantee you God's going to show up and going to meet you like you've never had before. You're going to say, huh? Questions you question and understand or don't know what's going on, he'll, he'll, he'll put them out. I've seen that before. That's what Sharon Bennell always told me. He says, she always says, when I come here to this place, they're dragging out of me. I say things I was not going to say or would say because they're hungry. They're calling on my anointing. When you start to call, guess what? God starts to remove things out of you like unbelievable. Problem is most people sit there and mm, won't let the Holy Ghost come out. It's time to let the Holy Ghost come out. It's, it's time to go. It's time to understand. It's time to, to see what's happening. It's time to get excited. You don't think people will come if you don't ask them? If you ask, well, they won't come if you don't ask them. But if you, if you ask them, they won't come because it's happened before. That's fine. Ask them and say, Lord, your problem, you bring them. You start praising God and worshiping him and thanking him for them to be here in this place. God's got angels. He can tie them up and drag them in here. You never know what God will do. See, we, we underestimate God sometimes. We got powers and authorities sitting around here, and, and we don't always use them, so we need to open them up and let God start to move. Praise the Lord. Well, what a blessed day that we have today. That was not in my notes. That was extra. So glory to God. Last week I talked about Jesus coming to earth. I always was told that the reason he came to earth was to die on the cross so that I would be saved. Until I start to learn a lot more. People always say that, you know, I've heard this so many times, but I kept saying there's more. My spirit was crying out. There's more to that. There's more to that. It's not just dying on the cross that he did, but that's usually what religion hits and goes after. I said, wow. Now I'm going to jump over to another plate. 
Sometimes I have a problem with that, and I can lose people real quick. I'll be talking, and all of a sudden they said, where are you at? You know, as the apostle gifting that I have, we have what, if you've ever seen on the TV where the plates are, they put a plate on, they spin it, and then they put another plate, and they spin it, and put another plate, and they spin it, and they're going around here. Well, that's my mind sometimes go there. I'm not multitasking like women do. It's just my mind's jumping from this plate to 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 this. Plate to this. And, and I'm talking sometimes that way. So I'm talking along, all of a sudden I'm talking about this over here, and everybody just lost them. Didn't know where they're at. Where did you go? Well, I'm still here. Haven't you caught up with me yet? So the fact is, if that's happening to you, you might have a, po a prophetic or the apostle gifting. Just think about that. So what's going on, I'm just telling you ahead of time, I'm going to another plate, but I will all bring it back to the first plate that I started with. I hope. And my mind keeps going the right direction. You know, it was kind of funny because I took and I had, my mind was just going that way, and I was trying to, you know, if you have your mind doing that all the time, you know how easy it is to sit and concentrate on one thing? When all these plates are spinning, you're trying to, Stop it! I'm thinking about this. Stop it! I'm thinking, you know. So one day, I took all the plates off those and put them on the table, and I went back thinking on that one plate, and next thing I knew, all the plates were running again. I says, oh, no, this is horrible. How do I get past that? So I gathered up all those plates, and I threw them out the window so they couldn't be put back up there, and I was finally able to concentrate on that one thing that I was thinking about. You know, sometimes you have to kind of visualize things, what you're doing, so you kind of figure it all out. But that was interesting when I learned about that. So anyway, I'll go on down the road. I don't know why I'm on that subject. But when we, what do you see when you look at the Bible? What do you actually see? Well, big family Bible sitting on tables with all the names and all the good stuff that get dusty all the time. People have several Bibles like myself that are stuck in, in bookshelves that I don't even read anymore. I read the Bible, but I don't read them. And what are they? What do you really see when you see the Bible? What is the purpose of having a Bible? And how do you see the Bible? I want you to think about this. Everybody will see it differently. Everybody will think about it differently. Everybody will understand it differently. I can come up with all kinds of understandings and words and thinkings about what people think about the Bible, but I'm not going to. This is about you. What do you think the Bible? That's a good question to ask on Tuesday and Wednesday. What do you think? What do you say? Just Each person should say what I think about the Bible, what it is. So if somebody else says something, the same thing you're saying, it doesn't matter. Say it again. The reason I bring this up is because we are the body of Christ, and we have to have some fundamental issues taken care of. The fundamental message of the Bible is greatly misunderstood. The fundamental message of the Bible is greatly misunderstood. And I was thinking about that because I ran across the saying, and that's what, I, what it was said, and I thought about that. What do I think the fundamental message of the Bible is? Salvation, born again, sacrifices, the law, blessings, cursings. We can go down through the whole thing. The Bible, in my opinion, and my opinion only, has become a book where men used to make doctrines out of. Think about that. The Bible became a book that men used to make a doctrine out of. Now, what is a doctrine? I said, well, let's go look at what a doctrine means. It's instruction, the function or the information. In other words, in the King James, it comes down to doctrine, meaning learning and teaching. So they go in and they learn something, and they take and they teach you this understanding the information that they have received. That's what doctrines are. In other words, if you believe the sky is red, that's a doctrine. 
If you think water is dry, that's a doctrine. If you don't think there's any air because you can't see it, that's a doctrine. That's what the people have done. They've taken something out of the Bible they believe, and they made a doctrine out of it. And I thought about that, and I'm saying, wow. What does fundamental mean? You must think about the fundamental use or the means of fundamental. It's the very beginning. It's the very, very foundation of everything that comes forth. Now, remember I said the fundamental message of the Bible is greatly misunderstood. If you remember what I taught way back about foundation in Job 38, 1 through 7. And this is an NIV, which we do not have on our projector up here. Uh, Sarah's going to try to get that version. I like this one the best because it, it kind of brings it out. It said, when the Lord asked Job out of the storm, he said, who is this that darkened my counsel with words without knowledge? I've done that before. How many people have told somebody something, but you really didn't know what you're talking about? And down the road, all of a sudden, you, you get some revelation, and you said, whoops, I've been saying that wrong. Anybody ever have that happen? Okay. This is what God said to Job. How would you like to have God say that to you? Who is this that darkens my counsel with the words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you. And you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? You go back and study Job out and see he's always saying, you know, if I could only talk to God, if I could only reason with him, he'd, he'd understand where I'm coming from. He knows, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations? You think you know it all? Guarantee you what? Let's ask God. Have God come up and ask you a few questions. Whoa, that'll knock you off your high horse. He says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand who marked out its dimensions. Surely you know who stretches a measuring line across it. On what was there, what, what, on what were its footings set and who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Now we went back and we talked about a footing. Without a footing, there's nothing for the foundation to be laid on. We talked about that. There's probably a CD back there, if we could find it, about that time in which I've actually talked about all that. If you want to go back and find it or look at it and see what's going on, or I can talk about it again. But that's what it's about. Do you know what the footing, the true footing, and the foundation that was totally built by God? If you come back up to where it says in, in 2, who is that that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? See, we're still talking about doctrine. That's what the person's doing. They're counseling people, but they don't have the correct knowledge. That's a doctrine. Without the Holy Spirit's guidance, you are not going to learn the correct way and thus teaching doctrines of men. Without the Holy Spirit guidance, you are not going to learn the correct way and thus teaching doctrines of men. You have to have the Holy Spirit. In, in John 14, 26, King James. 
But the Counselor, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth I unto you, but not, but let, yeah, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Oof. Think about that. How many preachers out there are fear-mongering? You can't do this. You can't do that. You, you know, and, and they start coming down and hell, fim, uh, you know, start talking about hell and all the brimstone fire and all that stuff through the years that I've heard. You know, the cowboy movies way back when, all they ever said was a preacher came in, scared everybody to death. And they came in with fire and brimstone. You're all going to hell. I'm not saying that ain't true in that time period or whatever is happening, but that's all they had. That's what they knew. That was their doctrine. But the counselor who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, I want to hit this a little bit. This is some revelation stuff. This is in-depth. This is not just uh, talking and going over as we've already knew and understand. This is getting the, the foundation down deep into the body of Christ. If we can get that foundation down. Is it too cold in here? Might want to turn the heat up just a hair. Brendan's got it. See a few people kind of getting chilly <laughs> so we got blankets up here too if anybody needs them we'll make that make sure you're comfortable so anyway as I went through that and I was hearing this all of a sudden I went back to what I said last week Isaiah 9 7 Isaiah 9 7 and of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end that's not all of it See, a child was given, a son was born, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now, up here it said in, in John fourteen twenty seven, Peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you, and not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Any doctrine other than peace is wrong. Any doctrine other than peace is wrong. Any doctrine that brings anything else other than peace is wrong. And you might say, how do I come to that conclusion? What did Jesus do in Isaiah 9, 7? God sent his son he sent his son to this earth to set up a government of what? Peace. He sent up that the kingdom is all about peace. You might say, oh, we're back to the kingdom again. Yes, we are. But if you don't have that full revelation of what God did, we got a problem. I don't know why the Lord's had me go back through this again. We teach about kingdom. But there's a revelation that he wants to put forth there. Now you want to put that football up? Call it the eye football. Because that's what it looked like when I first drew it. It doesn't look that way now. It looked like it had laces there instead of chairs. <laughs> it looked like an eyeball on the end. When <laughs> I was able to get on, on the publisher and make this one, but... Uh, I don't know how I got it done, but I did. But see, I really started thinking about this. And every person who re does not accept the Holy Spirit has got a problem. Because why? You can't enter into the kingdom of God without the Holy Spirit. And when you enter into the kingdom of God, what are you going to enter into? 
peace according to these scriptures. Jesus said, I leave you peace. What did he say up here? Uh, about, you can't come, you know, what did he do? Yeah, get my, I'm jumping off my notes here. I know what I want to say. I apologize, but I'll get this thing figured out. When Jesus, what happened was he had peace. He brought peace here. He set up peace. He made peace peace he made a government of peace he is the prince of peace why is the prince of peace he's a prince of peace simply because he isn't down here controlling the kingdom when he comes back he's coming back as a king and he will then have the authority over but today he only come as a prince of peace he's under the authority of the king meaning he's a prince in the kingdom of god and he brought peace god wanted peace Peace for his people. God wants us to walk in peace. God wants us to be. You know, what does it say about the shoes? Think about that. And the, and the armor. With shoes of peace. Bringing forth the gospel. Is that not right? See, that's what happened. He wants us to be in peace. And if we as the body of Christ do not understand what God did on the cross. What Jesus did on the cross was to bring peace to our life. If we're not walking in peace, we're not walking in the kingdom. Because we don't understand what the kingdom of God has brought to us and gave it. Jesus said here, you know, that's the comforter, John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. He brought the Holy Spirit back to this earth. After Adam lost it, he sinned. And it disappeared. And everybody went underneath the prince. The king still had authority. He says, I will give you the right to have a good life. If you do what I tell you, here's the law. Follow it. I'll bless you. You don't follow it, I'll give you the king or the prince. And he can take care of you. God sent down this, another prince. That beat out the, the prince, which is Satan. You don't have to listen to Satan. You don't have to walk with Satan. You don't have to even have anything to do with Satan. Why? Because right here, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, was released in such a way upon us. It says, which is the Holy Spirit who the Father, he, because he poured out the Comforter at, you know, at Pentecost. And, and it says, well, you know, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit who the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. Where do you get your doctrine from? The Holy Spirit. The understanding. You start coming up with an understanding or a situation, you better make sure the Holy Spirit is giving you the revelation or you'll be, like Job, darkening with counsel without knowledge. Because the Holy Spirit... Without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to know what's all going on. Yeah, there's a few things. If you jump in the river, you're going to get wet. Well, that's, that's, that's a doctrine. It's truth. This is just something the Lord is saying. We as the body of Christ really need to realize exactly what Christ did on the cross. He brought us peace. He gave us peace. We can walk in peace. We can be around people that you can't stand in peace. And if you aren't in peace, you're not walking in the kingdom of God. And you better get your act together and get in the kingdom. And if you don't believe that, Howard Pittman, I've seen this in his prophecy, in his, in his testimony, the, the placebo. You can go back to our webpage. You can go to ministries, go down to the links. Video links, go in there and it says, there's two different places for Howard. Howard Pittman says the five things for the Latter-day Church, the Laodicean Church. And the other one was the testimony, which placebo. Look at placebo. You go back in there past his testimony, which is towards the end. I can't tell you the actual location. But after he was with God and God's voice came down, which we played and told him how rotten he was and everything he did was all about himself 
and all of his works would be burned up. He didn't actually say that, but that's what he means. He says that God's wrath, not his everlasting wrath, which is going to hell, but his wrath would be upon me because I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Wow. And then he goes on a little farther, and he says this. And God put it to me plain as words and actions could make it in order for our works to be acceptable. In order for what you're doing is to be acceptable. In order for anything that you're doing in ministry, in prayer, around your family, whatever you're doing, every single thing that you are doing, and this comes directly from God to Howard, while he's standing by heaven, and he's talking about it. He says, everything, all your words, your actions, in order to make it acceptable to God, you must accept the command of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Think about that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What is it? It's seeking his Holy Spirit, which brings forth you into a place of peace that you can walk with. Yes, there's a growth process. Yes, there's things you have to get out of your spirit. Yes, there's situations going on. But I'm telling you, God's serious. You want to get up to heavens and say, well, I've been in church all the time. I've done all this. I've helped this. I've done that. You might be the same as Howard. Whoosh! All your works are burnt up. And you got to start all over up there. Because it was done in the wrong way. You've got to walk in peace. This is what the salvation. You get saved. You get into the kingdom of God. But if those others, go back to that uh, d diagram again of the kingdom. So there's people in the front that come in, and all they do, the religion, the doctrines of men, talk about Jesus. You got to follow Jesus. You got to do everything towards Jesus. This is the uh, actual diagram God gave me. That's what happens. Well, then you get baptized in the Holy Ghost. You find a church that has believes in, the, in Acts because the other first ones don't believe in Acts. I don't know what God's going to say to them when they get to heaven. Honestly, don't. Whew. I, not my problem. I hope they find him before and agree. But the thing is, then you come to the next one. It says baptized in the Holy Ghost. Because, see, I grew up in that church. But they didn't believe in the Holy Ghost. They didn't come against the Holy Ghost, which is a praise of the Lord. But they just said it wasn't for today. But they can't prove to you in the Bible that it's been ever been taken out. So then all of a sudden you got the second one here, and all of a sudden you fall back into the kingdom a little bit better because where's the kingdom of God? It's in the Spirit of God. But you're sitting here, and all of a sudden you're still getting a doctrine of man because they aren't following, they aren't listening they aren't getting the revelation of God. Some of it, yes, not all of it. So then all of a sudden what happens is, and how are you going to determine, because this just came downloaded, how do you determine if what they're saying is true? Now, the word of God is one thing, but you have to ask God and make sure it lines up with his word. You can look in the word, and yes, I, I can take all kinds of doctrines out of the word, you can, you can make this and this and this look perfect. But until you have the revelation of God on that word, you will not be in agreement. It's like with Pastor Macklin. I went to a meeting one time at another person's church, and he was there. He told me, the minute you walked in, he says, we are kindred spirits. There's something that's connected between us because, see, we're walking together in the spirit. Think about that. Kindred spirit. Have you ever been, you know, in a restaurant and your server, you know, the server comes up and you just feel something different about that server? Are you a Christian? Yes. You're a kindred spirit. 
See, there's a connection. Because you can hear in the Spirit. You can understand. You can know. And what's happening is, until you come in and you start to seek the kingdom of God, you will stay in those two realms. Some will grow a little farther. On the one that I had, I designed, I put a little square box on behind that last line. They'll come in and get a little prosperity. They'll come in and get their clothing. They'll come and get their housing. But see, they never go in far enough into the kingdom of God to get the truth. To really receive the peace. What does it say here? In John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall uh, teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whosoever or whatsoever I say unto you. And in 27, Peace I shall I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. What did Jesus, salvation, did he leave you? Being born again, did he leave you? Did he leave you going out to teach about him? No, he left peace. He left the Holy Spirit. He left the Holy Spirit. And that's not what's being really preached out there. And if it is, forgive me. I'm not saying there aren't some people out there preaching it, but he left the Holy Spirit. He says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, because it's a different type of peace. Let your heart, uh, let not your heart be troubled, ne neither let it be afraid. Think about that. When you get into the, the power of the Holy Spirit, what's going to happen? You're going to have such a peace, it's going to be unbelievable. The things that you've had problems with will start to calm down. That's what that's all about. And Jesus came, and he, he said in, in uh, Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of the government and peace, there shall be no end. The kingdom of God will never end. It will never end. The peace will never end. The Holy Spirit will not leave this earth anymore. The reason being is because when it was in man, the man gave it away. But when Jesus came down, he's not going to get away. He, there's no way anything can be stolen from him because there was no sin in him. That's another story we go down through, but I won't today. Another one came up here. In, in the uh, talking about the kingdom. Luke 14, 26. If any man comes to me and hates not his father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, and their own life also, he cannot be my disciples. I've had some great discussions on this one. People come up and say, my, uh, God says, I have to hate my, my father, my mother, my wife, my children, and my, my brother. You know, I have to hate them all in order to serve God. I'm saying, no, that's not what it says. But that's what he says. It said, I went back and looked at it again. It says hate in there. But if you don't read the whole thing, this is a, a King James. It says, and hate not your father. See, the people aren't picking up the whole thing, the whole understanding. They're saying, I've got to hate them, or otherwise I can't be a disciple. Wrong. Where do you get the discernment from? What kind of doctrine are you going to be if you have a pastor saying, you have to hate everybody in order to be a disciple? It's out there. Then I took and I went to the New Living Testament, Luke 14, 26. But if you want to be my followers, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife, children, brother, and sister. Yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciples. That makes more sense. It has nothing to do with hate. You've got to love God more. What does that mean? You have to pray and really get a revelation on this. You have to pray and ask because if your heart is not designed on serving and praising and worshiping God, but every time you turn around, you want to be around your family. I, I know family members that every night they get together, which is great. I, I love it. That's fantastic. That's what we need to do in the body of Christ. We are a family. We need to do more of that. We have one lady who wanted to do that. She says, every night I want to meet in a home and talk with somebody. 
That's her heart. That's what she wanted to do. And, but the thing, same thing is, when you come down to your father's mother's, and we had a little different situation in our life, uh, because I was a Christian, Debbie's father didn't like Christians, apparently, and she kind of said something, so she politely left the house. My parents were, grew up in church. We're Christians. Father was a real good Christian. My mother, because of the problems of being uh, adopted and having a real problem with God, uh, didn't really go to church very much. She was sick a lot. She had a lot of surgeries on her on her knee or her hip, I should say. Just a lot of different things through the years, and she just didn't go to church all that much. And so anyway. I took and and uh, we were down at my folks' house. We lived up north east or northwest Iowa. We lived. We went to uh, Oskaloosa, where we you know they lived at. Was sitting in, or in the garage, my wife and I, and my mom comes out and says, uh, "Debbie, would you go uptown and get some bread? We need some bread for for dinner." And as soon as she got in the car, she said, "Sure." She got in the car. I thought it was a little strange. She went down, got on the road to take and go back into town because you're just on the edge of town. And all of a sudden, my mom says, it's time to eat. And I says, okay. Uh, mom, that's my wife, and I will not eat until she comes home. She had purposely sent her out so that she wouldn't be around when we started to eat. That's how bad it was. We made a decision. I mean, my sister told me, before, she says, just take your religion and leave. We don't want to hear it. Well, we loved them. We care about them. We pray about them. But the fact is, we weren't around them. You know, even if they had loved us so much, we would still put God first. So you have to make a revelation on what you're doing and how much involvement you've got. That's what the Bible says. I'm not saying it. You must love God more than your own father and mother, wife, child, brothers and sisters. And that seems hard. But if we're all lined up in the kingdom, guess what? You won't have a problem. You'll all be serving God. You'll all be working great. It'll be fantastic. See, we don't look at that part. We look at, oh, it's going to hurt me. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I can't do that. Self-centeredness. Wow. We line up with the kingdom of God and everybody gets in the kingdom and we're all starting to grow and prosper and do the things. We all love one another. Guess what? You don't have those problems. You walk in peace. Think about that. That's what Jesus left. Peace. Then it was in John 3, 3, 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art teacher comes from, or you are a teacher come from God. So no man can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with them. See again, doctrine. I also, I'll put in this point, rabbi. If you have somebody come up and say they're a rabbi, be careful. Because a rabbi is a teacher. Rabbis in the Old Testament was actually the law of that time. When you come underneath a rabbi, whatever he said become law. That's how they grew. That's how they prospered back then. So if he misunderstood what the Torah was saying and he had a law that was wrong, or doctrine was wrong, then immediately you would came underneath the, that doctrine and you accepted it, then you're accepting something that was wrong. The Bible says, don't, don't call yourself a rabbi. Somebody today that's calling themselves a rabbi, you got to be careful for, because then they start to even override what Jesus is saying. If they're not listening to Jesus completely and understanding the truth, then you start coming underneath them and you're, you're, you're denying Christ. Because it says Jesus was the last rabbi. Jesus is the last rabbi. You can look at the Bible and see if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, 
please let me know. But he says Jesus is the last rabbi. He's the last teacher. We can only, see, we have to go, his yoke is light. What is his yoke? The teachings. Rabbis, when they taught in the Old Testament, again, was the teachings. And everything they taught was, you know, the way I understood that was from history, where the rabbis would go find young men, bring them in, and whatever they taught was those yokes around their neck, and they had to be obedient to their teachings. If not, then they wouldn't be a rabbi anymore. So what happens is, Jesus comes in, he's a rabbi, and he starts to teach 12 people, 12 young men that he brought forth. And what happens is that teaching that went around their shoulders, he says, my, my yoke's light. My teachings are light. That's what it's all about. That's why you got to be very careful about the rabbi. But he says, you know that thou art a teacher come from God. How many people know that you are a teacher that comes from God? Or a man or a woman that comes from God? How do they know that? How do they know he was a teacher that came from God? It says, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. When you have the teaching of Jesus upon you, and you teach that, guess what? You're going to have signs and wonders happen. Amazing things going to go on. Miles Monroe had said, teaching the Bible, or his teaching is, the Bible is a book about a king and a kingdom. And that is why Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Show me anywhere in the Bible that says to do this first. To do this first. The reason Jesus died on the cross was to bring the kingdom back, which is the Holy Spirit. And that's what it was, to make a government of peace so that you can walk in peace. You can live in peace. You can walk in peace. You can have peace in such a way that you're going to be amazed what God can do through you, for you, and by you. Just remember, for the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, whatever Jesus said, when you start to get the understanding of the Holy Spirit, you won't be a person like with Job. Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? You will have knowledge. You'll have wisdom from the Holy Spirit. There's many times that we... We wonder why there's so many churches out there. There's so many doctrines out there. There's so many unbeliefs out there. I'm going to tell you, next week I'm going to talk about how you figure out how you become one people with one language. How do you know? I was going to do that today, but I didn't get that far. I've got them in my notes if you want me to keep going, which I don't think so because our food's getting over there all ready to go. So <laughs> one of these days the Holy Ghost will hit us, and we will never leave until probably Monday sometime. Which is fine, but until that, I'm not going to do it. We're just going to follow the Holy Ghost and be obedient. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and we thank you. I pray, even though people understand what I've been talking about, but there's more of a foundation that what you really came back for was not just salvation, but Peace, a government of peace, to govern with the Holy Spirit, understanding to bring peace, not just to us, but to every person on this earth. And I don't know of anybody who'd like to walk in peace 24-7. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to understand how we can, through your kingdom and understanding your kingdom, can cause such a peace that even when people come around saying, wow, you have to have, you must be a man or a woman of God. Because there's no way that you can do it without that. Because the Holy Spirit has given you the wisdom, understanding how to walk in peace. We give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for what happened last week as we celebrate 
the rising up of your son when you were risen, Lord Jesus, and you went to heaven. And you released that Holy Spirit to bring upon us the peace. All the years that I had no clue that I could walk in peace, and I was not in peace. All those years that people are still here that have not walked in peace. Father, I pray that a peace of your love will fall on this place. When people walk in, there's such a peace in here that no matter what they try to do, it won't work because the overpowering spirit of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit will just knock it out of them. And the people around will love them so much that the peace will just be awesome. And I thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask that you bless this food to our bodies. Thank you for those who have, have helped, help, you know, bless the hands of those who have prepared it. And, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that each and every one will be uh, blessed by you. And great things shall happen this week. Father, we ask that your spirit just be strong upon all of us. We're learning and revelation knowledge and divine appointments, everything will start to just come to, together and we'll sit there and say, wow, this has been an awesome week. So bless each and every one until we meet and again in the name of Jesus. Amen.